Welcome to the Believe, Be Real, Be Bold podcast for authentic daters. I'm your host, Dave in Denver. Each week, we invite expert guests to come share their knowledge, tools, and tips to help you show up as your most authentic self. Hey guys, welcome back to our newest episode of the BBR podcast. My name is Dave Glazer. I'm, I'm here with uh, Jason Eric Ross. How are you today, sir? I'm fantastic. Thank you. How are you? I'm fantastic as well. It's beautiful in Denver. Uh, where are you hailing from today? Right now, I'm in Boca Raton, Florida, which is supposed to be sunnier today, but you know that's the break. Some days we get 60s and we have to deal with it. <laughs> right, right. So you say today you're hailing from Florida. It kind of sounds like you jump around a bit. Are you well-traveled? I wouldn't call well, but maybe uh, well enough for me. Sometimes I'm here in Florida, and often I'm in New York, which is where I'm from, actually. Born and raised New Yorker. Mm -hmm. And which would you prefer if you had your choice? Wow, that's tough. Yeah. Uh, there's a piece of me that New York is just home. I love being in the city. You know, uh, the south part of New York City is awesome. The whole city is great. So um, there's a piece of me. Every time I'm there, I'm like, wow, I wish I was still living here. But when you, when you hit... Uh, Today, days like today, I think it's about seven degrees, I heard, uh, up in New York. So, you know, it's going to be hard for me to complain about the 60-something degree breeze we've got here. That sounds ideal. You get to choose to go to New York whenever you want. And is that where you began your journey as a, as a psychotherapist? Or really, how did you get into this area of expertise that you're in? Partly uh, genetics and child rearing, growing up the son of not one but two psychoanalysts, which is uh, a couple of good jokes in and of itself. Both my parents were trained in psychoanalysis probably by the time I was eight. And watching both my parents work with people over the course of my life, uh, certainly my, my formative years, definitely had an impact. I definitely saw that people connected with them. Went into grad school just thought I wanted to go to medical school and I actually became a personal trainer and I grew into that field to a much greater degree than I ever thought. And when I moved to Florida uh, about eight, nine years later, um, I basically knew I was kind of going to get out on my own rather than being part of the company that I was in. And accidentally, I had helped a student of my mother's work on a dissertation. And what happened was he turned around and became my mentor. And it was a very, uh, I don't know if I'd call it fortuitous, auspicious. It was, it, it, I, I call it uh, luck, but a part of me says it's not luck. It was more than that. And it had been coming for decades. And just there was the synergy there. And I found the right mentor to take me the next step of the way. So that's the short version, if that's short. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. And other, other than just... Um gaining vision from a mentor, what was the next best thing that you got from that relationship? I definitely learned to really start trusting myself and to start taking some healthy risks. I was a pretty risk averse person, very, well, I wouldn't call myself uh, <laughs> tightly wound, definitely didn't take many risks. I kind of usually followed the standard path. And Basically, after about three months, he said to me one day, um, I was working for him part time, and he said, so what do you want to do when you grow up? And mind you, I'm like 35. And I said, I think I want to finally become a therapist. And he said, okay, let's make a call. And he called a friend at the local uh, community lockdown psych center and uh, got me an interview the next day. And I got hired and I began working on an intensive uh, emergency unit. And that's how I started to get my feet wet. And that probably was the most ex important experience I think I've ever had. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, um, among all that study time, when did you find time to become an actor? That came later. Uh, becoming, actually becoming an actor and following through on it, which is you know, definitely something I talk to clients about. And I mean the follow through part more so than the actor. Uh, while I was a trainer, I, I trained some people uh, from a couple of TV shows, and I knew it was always what I wanted. I had done stand-up comedy, but I got to the point in my 40s where I said, I'm going to have to follow through on this, or I'm always going to sit and wonder what if, and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to live with that regret. So I took the time to, what I actually first did was I checked 
when I had first looked at getting headshots and I found out it was eight years earlier and I hadn't followed through and I was not too tolerant with myself. And I said, you got to go, you got to get this done. And I got my headshots, got into an acting class or to a seminar or two. And I started to make plans to start training at a place in New York city called upright citizens brigade, um, which was started by Amy Poehler and a few uh, very funny guys, uh, Matt Walsh off the top of my head. Um, and I just said, this is it. Start, I have the room to start doing this. My practice is where I'm comfortable enough that I can take this risk, albeit this could end up crushing my practice. And I wasn't willing to do anything else other than find out. And that's how it started. And so far, considering the amount of time I've spent doing it, I'm pretty damn happy with it, I have to say. Always room to grow and is, you know, can certainly get further, maybe more famous. Um, it may be where I, you know, I decide how to balance both careers. Um, but you know, people ask, if you got famous as an actor, would you, you know, quit your day job? And the answer is never. I'll never quit being a shrink, that's for sure. I'll do both, I'll do it a different way. But I just kind of went and said, this is it. There's no other, there, there is no other alternative here. So being risk adverse and then switching your mindset to checking one of your bucket list items off, what's your key takeaway from that moment when you followed through on something you wanted to commit to? I think we have to be able to look ourselves in the mirror and your follow through largely is everything. If you get caught up in the, in the success of it, the outcome, you made a mistake. You got caught, you got lost. That you know, tends to go to your fear base the drive was that I have to understand this experience and I have to go through it. And likely I'm going to have to fail in order to grow. And I was willing to basically run headlong into a wall knowing it's probably going to hurt. Uh, you know, I, I definitely when I was younger, I can't say as I was that confident and that's why I didn't follow through the, the very first time as a 20 something. At this point, I'm like, man, I've had enough rejection. I should be an expert. Let's just go for it, man. And that's, that's basically what I did. You know, whether I'm talented or not, I have no idea. That's, you know, that's, you know, that's objective, subjective rather. So I just, I just went, I, I went for it and people kind of miss why I did it. Um, but, I, you know, it's not lost on me. And I, I do enjoy it, don't get me wrong. But I, I just knew um, bucket list wise, having knocked off probably my, one of my other bucket list items before that, I was like, how can I not do this? Um, and I had, I had knocked off the other bucket list item starting in 2011 mm -hmm. and, and, and comparatively a, more of a challenge. Mm -hmm. Got it. Now being a personal trainer and understanding that fitness and nutrition in and of itself is part of the personal growth process. And then you're failing in order to grow, uh, combining those two things for that experience. I like to talk to my clients about failing forward. And as long as you're moving forward towards a goal, you can fail yourself to that point. I think uh, Thomas Edison, when he was inventing the light bulb, said, I failed 9,999 times in order to be successful on that 10,000th try. That's exactly right. Great, a great idea. And it's, that's the way to go. And that's how I look at it, too, is that, you know, what do we say? If, you know, muscles are going to grow, you got to put them to some form of failure. And people get caught up in what failure means because there's some subjective shame base that's attached to it, usually from their childhood. So sometimes we have to eliminate that. And for me, it was a matter of, yeah, this is, you know, this might be a little bit painful, but I, I you know, I thought, especially at my age, I said, what's, what's so painful for me at this point? What haven't I endured that I really think I can't do at this point? And that, you know, that drove it too. So, you know, a little bit of age and, and experience did not hurt my cause. A little stupidity thrown in always helps. I'm all, all for it. I can completely relate because I made a career shift from hotels and restaurants in my 20s. 2008 came and the industry bottomed out. And I decided to go back to school for exercise science, powered through for about three years. And then I've been failing forward as a business owner for the last six years, um, impacting as many lives as I possibly can along the way. 
Um, but who, who is it that you find yourself working with most often that you're most passionate about now? It's a great question. I think there's a mix. I definitely enjoy working with people who've survived different types of trauma and really want a safe space to talk and grow and challenge themselves. I, I think that's about as fulfilling as it gets. I certainly work with a lot of parents who are struggling with their children in this day and age. Um, that work is difficult, getting parents aligned, getting them to agree. In an, you know, in, parents in general are not agreeing. There's a lot of fighting. I often joke that there's a 60% divorce rate, but there's another 20% that don't get divorced either because they can't or won't. <laughs> so it's more like 80. <laughs> so it's a, it's a pretty poor number. So I think those, working with a family that's having struggles, um, you know, someone who's in some type of emotional pain and they want some relief, and somebody who just says, I want a better life, I want more than I've got, and I need, I need some type of assistance, emotional support, a little uh, hand-holding to take me to the next step. Um, you know, sometimes as a therapist, and you can certainly do it as a trainer, um, you're reparenting in a way sometimes, and you have to know which role you're fulfilling. And I did watch that with my parents because um, I did grow up knowing some of their clients and their students. So that experience definitely affected me. Yeah, so in a nutshell, you're going to dive into their childhood experiences to maybe find out what's underneath and what's latently hiding and, and possibly holding them back from living that life that they want? Yeah, because that's where she, she, a lot of things that uh, if to give it a, a sort of an analogy, if we know the Back to the Future movie, we think of the space time continuum and there's like a break in this, you know, space time continuum. You know, and we remember Doc always says, Marty, you can't go back. Well, you can go back if you know what you're doing. And the, 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 sometimes you have to find that moment where people started to feel shameful. They had a traumatic event. They lost their joy they stop their childhood very often. Certainly trauma does that, sexual trauma, physical abuse, emotional abuse. So part of the psychotherapy that I do, because I do have a psychoanalytic background and training, is I, I want people to understand their past. There's always that theory, if you don't look at your past, you're doomed to repeat it. I believe that as a therapist. And while I employ a coaching sort of mindset in my practice, and I'm, you know, I'm tough with some clients, because that's what I think they need, um, I can be as compassionate as needed too in the right setting. They're going to have to look at, you know, why they keep making the same damn mistakes they're always making. You might want to take a look at if you keep failing. At a certain point, you might want to say, if I'm not moving forward and I'm not failing going forward, what are you doing? And people do have to examine um, their feelings of inadequacy, for lack of a better term. I think you hit it right on the head, and and that's why we started the podcast in the first place is I experienced the same patterns over and over and over again. And where I care about it most in my life is in my relationships. So if I wasn't succeeding, quote unquote, succeeding by having a good quality long-term relationship. I needed to dive into why that was for myself. That's right. And that's insight. That's insight and vulnerability, which are probably the two most important traits you need. It's definitely something I've learned in the last year plus is um, how to balance the appropriate amount of vulnerability with other people for one, but also allowing that vulnerability with myself. Great, great approach. Great approach. Really is. And, you know, then you, and you can put that out there once you do it. You know, you, that, you know, vulnerability isn't like just a one-way door. You can put it out. And that's, you know, again, that's what, that's what people miss. And I think more of the struggles that we see nowadays is because people didn't want to be vulnerable because there's some experience or connotation that, you know, don't do it because you're going to get hurt. Well, you know, heaven forbid we should get hurt because that's wrong. You know, that's how parenting is done a lot, you know, nowadays. No one should have a bad feeling because that could upset somebody. Right. And what I've learned in this uh, short amount of time, maybe the last two years of really in-depth dis self-discovery and personal growth is that whether I'm vulnerable or not, I'm going to get hurt. 
So why not choose to be vulnerable? Because that releases so much from my, the weight on my shoulders and it allows the right people in. That's right. Great, great comment. I, the, in counseling, certainly in what they call dialectical behavior therapy in particular, there's this notion, um, pain, is pain is inevitable, suffering is a choice. So you're going to have some of this stuff happen. And to put it back towards you know, my decision to act, part of it was I got things in a fairly good place. And I thought, I've had bad stuff happen, but rarely have I made the decision to go do something that was risky based on my own idea. And I thought, I have a way I can do this. And it's my decision. And, I have, and by doing so, I have some control in it. Yeah, there'll be some, there'll be some hits along the way, but so what? I'm going to get up. And when you know you're going to get up, when you have that confidence, that does change you know, where people are at. I just think enough people haven't gotten there yet to really, you know, pound themselves with that. Yeah. Uh, I want to, I want to incorporate this fitness background that you and I both have because mm -hmm. fitness is a great way to introduce somebody to personal growth because every single time that we increase the weight just a little bit on an exercise, it's pushing the comfort zone. And I think that that's what you were just about to hit on is this comfort zone, but everything we've ever wanted is just outside of that. Absolutely, absolutely. I think people are afraid of that. And so when we decide, yeah, I can do it, you know, the, I, I think you, if you look everywhere between social media, your, social media, et cetera, you'll always see those, you know, those memes, et cetera, you know, uh, success is right outside of your comfort zone. But it really is true. The people who practice that, you know, repeatedly get it. Fitness is a great way to get vulnerable because any of your inadequacies, if, like, if you know, I admire anybody. I worked a lot more so in training with weight loss. I admire anybody who's overweight and will go to the gym and put themselves out there because of what we see in society, how much they can get shamed, body shamed, et cetera, that they take that risk. I really respect that because arguably they shouldn't be doing it, yet they're challenging themselves because they're running great risk at feeling uncomfortable. So fitness is just one of those things where you can just cut through somebody's psyche and their being. That's what's great about fitness. Fitness is mind body in and of itself. Yeah. And that, that really creates vulnerability. I, I love that description because I, I completely agree that when somebody in a fitness setting gets vulnerable, like the overweight client that you were talking about, that's brave enough to, um, to even just begin the process, then that vulnerability, even though they're not like expressing it verbally or shouting it from a mountaintop, they're still putting themselves out there and we're getting to the root core of the issue which if we could talk about Brene Brown and shame and vulnerability as a, as a combination, maybe in that context to paint the picture, and that's as simple as it needs to be, right? You don't need anything else. That, that can be the basis pretty much for everything. From a therapy standpoint, let alone from personal training, um, I, I kind of look at it the same way. You have, to make, you have to feel badly about what you're doing, and there's a connotation that you're not supposed to. And that's, that's, that's a myth. And I think that's people are misled. It's okay to feel badly if it's congruent relatively with how you ought to feel. Shame, you know, the difference between guilt and shame, you know, guilt is I did something wrong, I or did something bad, and shame is I am bad. People who have shame have to understand why they have the shame. And if the reason isn't really valid, they can get rid of it. They might be able to come up with another reason and then they can own that. And then ultimately they can get some change in their life. But if they're not going to challenge that core principle, generally speaking, shame is that, uh, again, that, that mark in the space time continuum where everything went off kilter. Everything, you know, we just took a different direction and you got to go back to it to sort of deal with it and move forward from it. Yeah. You said a key word in there. 
they need to feel badly about their current situation in order to take movement forward. Yeah. And where, where I hear it a lot is I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Yes. And that's maybe like our culture's inactivity. So many people have desk jobs. We drive too much. We're on our phones too much. Where our lifestyle is inactivity versus where it used to be. And that's why we're so full of disease. Yep. And for me, for, for me personally, I really, I've been in fitness for the last 20 years. You know, I, I use it to manage my stress and balance out my confidence levels and really just all encompassing. If I don't have it, then I don't live very well at all. And where I see, um, where I see my clients coming to me is that they recognize their body is communicating them to get started, to get moving so that they can make that change that they need. Right. And how would you maybe work with somebody, peel back the layers of the onion to understand where that shame began? Generally, I would ask them questions about their childhood. I'd ask them to just, I'd first go for the general description, just the general, see what comes up. And then I start to dig into that. You know, I, I'll ask questions like, you know, what, you know, what kind of home did you grow up in? You know, how are you parented? How are you disciplined? That's always a really telling thing. The discipline piece um, is interesting because discipline in the parenting paradigm should change and develop over time. You can't parent a two-year-old the way you parent a 13-year-old. The problem is some people do that. You know, I know children who were hit until they were in their teens and it doesn't work. It's, it's an ineffective technique in general. So there's no shift there. But what you find a lot of the times, if you, could make, if you ask the questions, is people who are physically disciplined you can see certain patterns with them. The longer the physical discipline went on and the severity, you can see the issues. Having worked in the substance abuse treatment field, I saw it at its furthest point when that shame was so profound that people would begin to use and punish themselves lots of different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some ways other than that substance abuse that um, an individual may cope with this kind of um, upbringing or experiences in dealing with trauma? There's a couple of different trauma responses. Obviously, you know, drugs and drinking would be one, but people have other addictions, process addictions, and what you sometimes see with a lot of people who have very much struggled with their weight um, and gained significant amounts of weight is there's some underlying trauma there. Food is the first medicator. It's the first medicator for most people. Generally speaking, seven-year-olds don't get their hands on heroin. I think we can reasonably say that it happens too and awful, but food is in everybody's life. And you know, certainly culturally, food is used to medicate in many, or it can be anyway. You know, we eat, you know, it's like the jokes from, uh, from Austin Powers, you know, I eat because I'm unhappy, but I eat, you know, he, you know, he just, the guy just eats no matter what. It didn't matter what holiday it was or whatever, but people learn how to take it in. And at a point it becomes a rote behavior. It becomes innate and you don't even realize you're doing it. Um, for some it's shopping, for some it just can play out in depression. It can play out in malaise. It can play out in very poor or angry or conflictual relationships. And at the end of the day, if somebody isn't like saying, you know what, I feel good and grateful about the life I have, what do you have? Mm -hmm. and people have, you know, you're saying with disease, um, people have lost sight of what we're kind of supposed to do. We're, you know, the idea of humankind is to connect. But when we have a society that's generally on their phones and not making eye to contact, it becomes a little bit more problematic. That's why we see a little bit more sociopathy now than we did 20, 30 years ago. And I'm, I'm not against the phones. I am against how they're used, particularly with children. I think electronics with children is 
it has to be handled very carefully. I'm very staunch about some of the parenting stuff that I do. Mm -hmm. And I think parenting has changed so much that it's harder to get to some things because there's this idea that everybody's a winner, you know, those eighth place trophies and, um, I'm trying not to do any voices where I mock anybody, but uh, sometimes I try to, you know, to make it a little more humorous because it's a tough subject. Not everybody can win. And children, if you really want to raise a, a resilient child, that's what you have to do. When I ask parents, what's your job as a parent in one sentence? The number one answer I get is I want my child to be happy, which is one of the worst decisions you can make as a parent. The only answer that's really appropriate is I want to raise a resilient child who can handle anything. That's really what the bottom line is. And we've gotten so far away from that, that um, I'll build my 401k off of it. Got it. I tell clients that flat out. That's, that's, definitely, that that's definitely bold for sure. And uh, I think that we do need as a society, a little slap in the face when it comes to um, your eighth place trophies or everybody's a winner and nobody can have their feelings hurt. But right. I, wa I want to touch on this losing sight of connection because we were just about to jump into talking about relationships and let's combine the last little bit of our conversation together of what kind of patterns can we see with people who maybe need to dive back into their childhood in order to peel back the layers of the onion to discontinue that pattern of behaviors in relationships? I think we have to have a certain willingness and openness and insight to check ourselves at the door. And I think that's what we struggle with more and more. Look, the, the rates of depression, drug use, um, obesity, diabetes, suicide, mental health disorders in general are higher than ever. You know, we have more technology and we have more things we have more available to us but somehow we're not developing emotionally and you sort of sit if you're in my shoes anyway and you say how the hell is this possible well there's one way we we didn't learn the tools that we needed growing up and usually that's being connected connected to family gratitude eye contact empathy i always like gary vaynerchuk who you know talks about empathy a lot um, but I, I think empathy is one of the big things we're not seeing enough. And those people who have the empathy can connect. You can be happy for somebody even if you don't have the same success. But we're not cultivating that as a society. So take that into the dating world. You know, you're not connecting. You're not even connected with yourself. How are you going to show up and connect in a healthy way with another being? Well, you can show up and connect with another being who might not be healthy if you're not healthy. You know, like attracts like. So uh, there can be, you know, one dating site after another, but the numbers don't indicate that we're growing. We're not better. Um, you know, for stand up, there's like an hour of material on this easily. Oh, at least. I, oh, yeah. But, uh, but I, I think that's where we're, where we're, we're going to struggle. I think we're struggling, and I think it's going to get worse. And I'm an optimist, but, but I'm sure of it. I think it's really a struggle for people. So what skills can somebody use? What tools do we have available to us to change that? Well, it's going to start with us, one person at a time. And then over time, it will help us change society. But where can somebody start? And what tools and skills can they use right away to make that not the case for them anymore? the first thing that would come to mind is willingness. And when I say willingness, that means willingness to check yourself at the door. Check your own stuff. Go talk to a therapist. Own that there might be something about you that you might want to look at. You know, if we don't think we can improve, you know, that we're fully formed. You know, I've been in therapy every decade of my life and I'm, I'm going to be turning 50. So I've had to do the work. I'm willing to do the work. And I do this for a living. Why shouldn't somebody else have to do their work? Like, I don't, I don't, that, that's like, there's no equity there. I don't get that. So if people are really willing to look at it, do the, be willing, what they might find is they'll get insight 
and they can turn that insight into appropriate action. And when I say that, I mean, they can start to develop better, healthier communication skills. They can really express their emotions. You know, if we talk cognitive uh, behavioral therapy, the four feelings, mad, sad, glad, and afraid. And most people don't know how to really express themselves on all of those. And the way we parent nowadays is that children shouldn't be mad or sad, which is absolutely insane. If you don't learn how to manage mad and sad, you'll definitely be afraid or anxious and you ain't got a chance at being happy. So I think we have to be willing to look, learn from the past and own what are we doing? You know, are we showing up? How are we showing up with other people? Um, it's easy to blame everybody for the relationships, but how often does the person say, I have to take full accountability and responsibility for this. And um, that's what's, you know, that's what's missing. Yeah. And every skill is built off of that. Dialectical behavior therapy is great that way. That, that, that's a, a set of skills if, you, if someone goes into it. It's usually the treatment prescribed with borderline personality disorder. However, it's not just for that. It's a great set of skills. They should teach it in schools. Mm -hmm. And people will show up differently. I, I wholeheartedly agree. I've spent the last year uh, speaking to a counselor at least once a week. Uh, well, excuse me, at least every other week um, in a cognitive behavior therapy setting. And what I learned is that there's zero judgment there. It's actually like the safest place for me to feel mad, sad, glad, and afraid. Mm -hmm. And I walk away from each and every conversation, uh, speaking most of the time, which is not something I get to do throughout my workday. You know, I'm, I'm the listener at, at my job. Right. You're the therapist then. Yeah. Much like yourself. So if you and I are leaders in our small community and we're expected to help make great change, but yet we're not able to communicate from our point of view, well, shoot, that's exactly why you and I need to speak to somebody objective. That's right, that's right. Having a safe space to talk, to validate yourself is very important. And I think it's also good when people have done that, that they're ready to challenge themselves at that point to make some shifts. Too many people get victimized and it's a bad place to, be because it's really ineffective in relationships but having a safe space with a counselor where you can really talk about how you feel what your experiences are the good the bad and particularly the ugly that's critical because that's where you get changed because that, again that's the vulnerable that's when your pain comes out your anguish and the only way to shift that is by talking about it and not only that subject uh, an objective person who's going to listen and then provide feedback from a from a professional standpoint but also i'm not coming home at the end of the day and and dumping that emotional onto somebody that i love and care about where they need to be that supporter or that support beam for my life because that's not fair either no and a lot of people do that they take it home with them so I think, you know, question I also, I often get asked, you know, something to the effect of, well, how do you deal with it? Well, sometimes I go to, I'll go to speak to somebody and I've done it throughout my life. So I have a little more experience in how to discharge it, but I have to know that it's there. And sometimes I don't want to bring it home. And most people do bring it home. And then they wonder why their relationship isn't working out well, which is more shocking, of course, but what do you think was going to happen? Right. I, I think that that's where the insight piece comes into play as a huge leap forward for people. A willingness to be insightful on your own behavior, your actions, and your thoughts so that you can build stronger relationships with those people that you're meant to spend the most of your time with. That's right. And you have to value that piece tremendously. Like, what is the value of time? You know, uh, Steve Jobs, one of the richest people in the world, what couldn't he buy? Warren Buffett said it, you can't buy time. Yeah. So how much do you value every minute and how open, connected can you be with people? And that's where we've lost out. And there are people who do it really well. But I think so many more people had some other expectation that 
the relationship would make them happy or some job or, and none of that really works because rich, famous people who have money die by suicide. And that's all you need to know. That's the mark. That's the proof that it doesn't work. Yeah. You have to feel good about yourself and those things don't really do it for you. Right. Absolutely. Um, I've, I've joined accountability groups. You know, I have a men's group that I go to. I do see my counselor regularly that helps me with career and parenting and checking myself at the door basically. Cause if I get into this bad habit of seeking validation from external sources, like a good job, a great relationship or somebody else who uh, loves me for me. Well, I can't have any of those things until I find that love for myself. The, the validation has to come from here. Has to. That's correct. It has to. And if someone's not willing to do that and look at themselves critically, no matter how good, bad, or crappy a childhood may have been, it's hard for them to heal because you have to have, I, I think, you have to take responsibility. There's effective blaming too which is important because you got to know what's your fault and what isn't. Um, you can't be at fault for everything usually. So that's what people struggle with. And then again, you know, they wonder why the relationships struggle. It's like, well, who showed up? Did the, did the hurt child in you show up today? Well, you know, who wants to have that relationship? Mm -hmm. And that's why so many people struggle. I, I will. I'm in a hundred percent agreement. And then there's a small piece of me that says, well, if I'm going to find the relationship that I want, there has to be a small amount of grace for my mistakes and that small amount of grace from my partner to support me when I do need it. And maybe one day out of the month, I do bring that home and I do want to connect more with the person that I'm with in a supportive kind of way. Does that make sense? I know there's not a question there, but yeah, I think there's, there's got to be some flexibility in the system. It's going to happen. And there's the, uh, if you've ever seen the video, it's not about the nail. That's about validation. If you, you just go on YouTube and you check out, it's not about the nail. It's one of the greatest videos, about two, three minutes, really well written, all about validation. When we would do um, dialectical behavior therapy, we would show it to clients because it's just that good. It's just about listening to someone, even if you don't necessarily agree, but they know you're there for them. And that's very important in relationships. Ultimately, a person really has to do it for themselves first. Mm -hmm. You got to validate self and hopefully then you'll find a partner who can do it too. Yeah, because eventually that person is going to be a reflection of yourself. And if you're validating yourself and not seeking that approval or validation from anyone else, then you'll end up with a partner who's doing the same thing for themselves. Right. And I think that after, after this journey of seven or eight months of interviewing experts like yourself on the podcast and doing that challenging, hard, dirty work myself also, I think that's the one thing I've learned and the big takeaway for me. It's a great takeaway. When you've done your work, you know. You know you, it's one of those things you don't have to explain to anybody. It's innate. You just know you did it. Uh, it's like one of the ultimate self-esteem builders. And you don't have to shout about it. You don't have to talk about it. You don't have to tell everybody. You just know in your heart. And that's, you know, that's a critical piece. Mm -hmm. So good well, for you for doing it. That's, that's, that's awesome. It has not been easy, but it has been worth it. And uh, I, I love what you just said that, like, I don't need to shout it from the mountaintops. And that might be why the first season of the podcast didn't really have my story behind it because I, I didn't need to shout it. But what I do realize is that I want to be more vulnerable as this leader of a small community that's growing in authenticity and vulnerability. Because if I'm still shut down and I'm not sharing my thoughts and my opinions in my heart, then my community won't either. You have to connect, right? So over time, that's what, you know, that grows. But someone who does the work, ultimately, they, they get that message out. Well, whether it's verbal or nonverbal, somehow they get it out there and people connect. Yeah. That's, that, and that's really important. 
that's the key component to maintaining my happiness during a time when my professional life hasn't been the best that it's ever been. You know, being a personal trainer for six years, I, I had one of the worst quarters of my career after six years of being in business. And mm -hmm. without doing that dirty, hard, deep work, how many times did I want to quit? But I said, no, I'm not going to quit. How many times did I want to throw in the towel and just say, you know what? I want this, but I can't. And that's resilience. That's resilience. That's resilience. And resilience is only born out of somebody's work on themselves and or some uh, parallel of their, their self-esteem. Because we just say, this is not the only mark of who I am. I'll get through and it'll be the, you know, it'll be the next quarter. Not all the quarters are supposed to be awesome. Not everything is just a linear or exponential, you know, growth chart like we see on a, you know, on a TV show in a skit. Yeah. Sometimes right. there's, there's, you know, there's, exactly, there's, there's, there's variations and that's what's supposed to happen. But right. you, you can still grow even when it's, you know, when it's a crappy or less than you expected kind of time. It's actually where we sometimes grow more. That's the yeah. challenge. True testament to that, let right. the hardship is the catalyst for growth. And some of the expert guests that we've had on in the past, they've said, very, very rarely do, does somebody come to me and say, hey, my life's great. I really want to take it to the next level. No, because when we seek out help, it's because we, we're like – craving that connection, maybe for one, somebody who's going to be a listening ear for another, but also to elevate and to level up because we're not happy with being sick and tired anymore. Right. right. Yeah. You got to feel that pain. People have to feel some pain and the, and the smart move is to choose to do it rather than have it happen to you. And mm -hmm. most people had it happen early in life, not by choice. So they're a little more averse to, you know, doing it now. Um, but those of us who get around to say, you know what, I have a chance to grow. It's a growth opportunity. I'm jumping in. I don't have to like it. I have to be willing to do it. You know, I never tell anybody psychotherapy is, it, look, you're going to have just a really great time coming to see me. It's a lot of fun. All I do is make jokes. And, uh, you know, while I can make light of a lot of things and I can bring some humor, man, if you're not doing work, um, maintenance is fine if, you, if you're at a point where maintenance is good or you know, you've gotten to a certain point where you just want to grow a little bit more. But when you're in a struggle or you know, your, your life isn't where you kind of had hoped, you better, you better be ready to endure some pain. Otherwise, you're not going to get change. And you know, a lot of people, they, you know, they go through these patterns. They do it again and again. No change. Why? Is it intelligence? No. Emotional intelligence, maybe. Mm-hmm. Emotional intelligence has to be challenged too. Yeah, and an, an awareness piece of where we're at personally, professionally, spiritually, oh, yeah. mentally, emotionally, physically. Oh yeah, yeah. That self-awareness piece is, is something that we can't look over and, and uh, skip either. That's right. Too many people have the idea that they shouldn't have to work on it. I tell clients it's basically kind of five factors, emotional, social, intellectual, uh, physical and spiritual. Those are the spheres of wellness in essence. And everybody's got to sort of do a gut check and say, Oops, uh, you know, how well am I, how well am I doing that? And most people hadn't thought of it. You know, we, I think we just kind of go blindly through the world now. Um, you know, you know, Bill Burr, the comedian, if you've ever heard of him, he sort of talks about people like, you know, is this another shoe store? Like we're just walking around, like just <laughs> accumulating stuff. <laughs> and it's like, oh, this is on sale. And it, you know, we're, we're, we're just, we're, 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 what are we doing? You know, we're lost. So being grounded and connected, yeah, you end up vulnerable and you can get that change. And, and the pain should happen. If it doesn't, I think you're just doing something wrong. Right, got to feel the feels. Yeah, yeah. And I'm all for empathy and people healing, but man, oh man, you're going to have to work through it. And that's where people, you know, have really struggled. And the parenting has gone with that. Well, I don't want my child to have any struggle. Well, great. That's going to be a really good setup for high school. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, I have, I have a high school age daughter now, and 14 to 16 was really challenging. Mm -hmm. But uh, both her mother and I agree that. 
that she's coming out of it stronger than she went into it. Yep. And, Good for uh, you. and I, I know just listening to her and talking to her, um, she grew up really fast in those two years. And she herself would probably say, I feel better now than I did two years ago. Then you guys handle, you know, you handle it. And, you know, parents, whether, you know, uh, together, separated, et cetera, can work together. And I just think we have less of it because everybody wants to be the best friend. Everybody wants to be right. And parents have to be aligned. Um, and that does create a lot of business for me. Uh, the parents are not aligned. They're, everybody's fighting out their own battles, their own, and their own, you know, we're talking about like checking your, your history, um, you know, knowing what family of origin you came out of, um, really important. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, it's tough and it's tougher than ever to raise children. There's no question about that. There's much more you have to be aware of. There are more challenges in terms of, uh, you know, keeping up with the Joneses for lack of a better term. So parents really have to be ahead of the game. They have to be planning, plotting, methodical, manipulative, and parents will always say, oh, I don't want to be manipulative. Good luck, because <laughs> you're going to need to be, because you're dealing, you're dealing with a child who is growing in this modern world, and it's very different than what you, know, uh, you or I grew up with. Certainly, definitely different than what I grew up with. Um, technology started to change after. Sure. I think in a, in a way, I'm, I'm going to expand, maybe, maybe ask you this question about the manipulation. If parents don't, quote unquote, manipulate their children with their best interests in mind, then their peers at some point are going to do it. Correct. And if we can be ahead of the curve and be a proactive approach to um, molding our children's resilience so that they're, ants or that they're not so easily manipulated by their friends. Is that what you're trying to say? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. What's the, what's the idea uh, Billy Crystal once said? You know the difference between the class comedian and the class clown? The class clown is the guy who runs across the, the football field naked at the final home game. Class comedian is the guy who convinced him to do it. <laughs> you want to be the class comedian. And how you do that is a relative. It may be that you make a, you know, they always say the best suggestion is you let the other pe person think they came up with it. That's a parent's job. You know, that suddenly, that, you know, planting a seed, just, you know, again, it's like, well, how do we, you know, parents want to say, well, you don't manipulate, you do. You motivate children, don't you? That's what parents generally do. They push the child. That's manipulation. It's, it's the connotation um, is sometimes bad, but the reality of it is that's what you do as a parent. That's what you're always doing because you're playing defense. You want to play offense, guide and push. Um, rather than have to play defense, because if you don't step in, yes, the peer pressure is greater. There is no question that peer pressure is greater. And I wouldn't uh, condone it, nor do I ever say it's an excuse, but you do have to be aware of it, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. I, I know that you're a busy, busy guy, so I won't take up too much more of your time. If somebody wants to get a hold of you, what's the best way to do that? The best way probably is I guess probably going on social media um, at Jason Eric Ross, where they can go to my website, jasonericross.com. I tend to post little videos, stuff that uh, I think people need to hear, whether it be parenting, dating. You know, the world has changed so much, so people have to be willing to like make themselves vulnerable in order to connect. Otherwise, they're going to be just blocked off. Very true. And they'll endlessly be stuck if they don't awake to the fact that uh, take down that wall, take off your mask just one time and see the, see the true connection and the benefit from that. Yeah, exactly. People have to be willing to challenge themselves. And I tell people the fact that I'm a therapist is not the issue that they should necessarily look at. The fact that I've done this, I've knocked off two of the biggest things on my bucket list. If I didn't knock off another thing on my bucket list, I'm going to be okay. But putting yourself to that challenge and, and understanding that it's, it's not grad school or anything else. It's what you do. And, you know, just like we've been, you know, we've both been to school, but what we do with it, that's what matters. And people have got to put themselves to that test. 
Very true. If we're not growing, we're dying. Pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Got to keep growing. Yeah. Well, man, I want to say thank you for your time. That was an exceptional conversation. Thank definitely, you. Definitely something I needed to hear today. And uh, as I fail forward for the rest of 2019. Um, That's where we're headed for. Yeah. <laughs> What do you say in the next six to 12 months we jump on the podcast again or, or do something uh, community-based and uh, I'll come out to Florida, get some sun, and, and we'll do something. Uh, we'd, we'd love it. That'd be awesome. All right. That'd be great, man. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks for having me. My pleasure.